weird, you guys. <laughs> so much dust in here. Are you allergic to geeks? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I must be allergic to myself. <laughs> Alright, I've been kicking these off, I'll kick it off. I <laughs> have <laughs> yeah, same stupid question. <laughs> Overall, as a piece of television, a drama, whatever it is, what do you feel Fringe's greatest accomplishment is doing? I you know, I don't think that the whole world knows this. Um, I think Fringe's greatest accomplishment is the fact that it is a sci-fi show that's not really a sci-fi show. Um, I think that that's the world that it's based in. But it is, it's just about people who love each other and want to be happy and satisfied. It's like, you know, every romantic comedy or soap opera or, you know, 90210, <laughs> um, you know, show in the world, but it happens to be in this world of sci-fi. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, think, oh, I'm not into sci-fi, so I'm not going to watch that. And I just think that they would be so shocked if they watched our show to see how well we've been able to integrate, you know, uh, these, you know, kind of uh, overwhelming things about technology and, and um, corporations and, and medicine and how that's affecting our lives and also how it affects our lives. Like these people, these very real people who have these intimate relationships with each other. Um, and I know that there are other sci-fi shows that have done that too. But I can't think of any that have been on network TV. It's like such a perfect setup for for new people who don't really watch sci-fi shows to be involved, and they've totally missed out. It's like the best kept secret in the world. To see the end inside. Awesome. It feels so good. I think that. Um, we're all excited for what opportunities are going to come after Fringe, and hopefully we will all be fortunate enough to, to keep working on really great shows, but at the same time, we recognize the enormity of knowing that you get to finish telling your story, and nobody has to keep fighting, and nobody has to come back to work on Monday and wait to find out like what the numbers were for Friday night. You don't have to do that anymore. So it feels like this is going to be the easiest thing ever. Like All we get to do is have fun, and we get to tell a really good story because that's the priority. You know, it's not, like I said, it's not about numbers, it's not about money anymore. They took all our money away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just us and like a stage and a bunch of bald guys and we're going to tell the best story that we possibly can tell. And you know, it's so funny because we all, all the actors at different points have kind of gone on roller coasters, you know, uh, with their relationship with the show, you know, I felt like I didn't have very much to do for a lot of the time. And Anna, you know, was exhausted a lot of the time, felt like she was doing too much, and just lots of different uh, experiences. But to come at the end of it and really realize that everybody's heart is in it and everybody has learned so much and enjoyed working with each other is such a, a special thing to share with a cast that you've been with for 18 hours a day for five years. It's just crazy. It's longer than college. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment if it was not. <laughs> uh, what about now that you know that Walter actually knows what your name is and he still <laughs> continues to call you something else every week? Why do you think that is? Your from your character's perspective, I guess? He knows her name. I know. And she knows he knows her name. <laughs> You know what, I think it started in season two, and it might have been season one, I remember, but pretty early on he said her name like one time, and then it took like, you know, eight episodes, and then he would say her name. And he would do it periodically, and it was clear that he knows her name. I think that he is intent on saying her name wrong just to mess with her, but sometimes he forgets, like when shit gets real, and he's like, oh, we are really on to something, Astrid, and he's probably like, damn it! <laughs> Nickname, and I totally forgot what it was. That's what I mean. I think that she, um, that's his way of, of showing affection for her. I don't think that he is comfortable, given his history with his son, in um, in being able to communicate love very easily. And that's why he does weird things like makes you know cakes in the middle of the night and like tries to suck candy down your throat. Like that's the only way that he knows how to show that love. And I think with Astrid, it's with you know calling her pet names. Which What's is your why. Favorite? Favorite? Mm -hmm. 
I'm over the pet thing. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Well, Claire's a great one, but in the next, um, in the next episode. So one time we were in a rehearsal, and he, we were just kind of like doing lines off the top of our head. And he didn't have a script, and he knew he had. He was supposed to call me a nickname, and he just said Afro. <laughs> He just blurted it out, and then everybody laughed, and I laughed, and then he came up to me afterwards, and he said, is that politically correct? And I said, that's not a bad word. Um, I appreciate your Australian sensibility. You don't know, and I'm telling you, Afro is not like the A word or anything. And so in this next script, he calls her Afro, so it's like full circle. Yeah, exactly. Are we going to see Astrid get like a better fleshed out storyline this year? I um, don't want you to have high expectations because I don't. Um, which is not to say that it's a disappointing thing because it's our last season and we only have 13 episodes and I, you know, I don't um, imagine that her storyline will be priority but what I do hope um, if anything does happen with her storyline, I just want there to be some closure with what happened to her dad. I don't know if, because you know, the fifth season is going to take place in the future, in 2036, but she was Amber kind of like a last minute decision, so I don't think she said, Dad, I don't know if I'm coming back. And I'm pretty sure that her dad isn't, you know, around in 2036. So I'm hoping that there's some kind of um, attention paid to that. Because that's the first time you ever see her dad. It's the first time you see anybody in her family that she cares about. And so I think it would be a big oversight to just leave that blank. And I want at least just to see her going through some kind of, you know, emotional discourse about what about my dad? You know, he's not around anymore. And that's so pivotal because when she meets the other Astrid, she finds out that her other dad had died. So I'm sure that that's in her head, you know, like what happens to your family and what happens to you when they're not around anymore. So I hope for Astrid's story that that is, is the question that's answered. So going into Fringe, like before you even started, what were your expectations and what expectations did you never have that just sort of blew you away as you went through? Um, expectation, don't get killed. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, expectation I didn't have. The biggest mind-blowing thing that I did actually wasn't the doppelganger stuff, um, but was was the singing. I had I had no idea that we were going to we were going to go there, and um, especially in this in this world. And I think that it worked out surprisingly well. Like it made it made sense that you know it wasn't so over the top and outlandish. Um, but that was really surprising. And they did not have me singing in it because I. I have music in the background. <laughs> and so I wrote and I said, I have music in the background. I hope that you did it. Which was really, really awesome. <laughs> so, so a spin-off of choice, Farnsworth P.I. or Brown Betty the Broadway musical? Oh, <laughs> Farnsworth P.I. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It was nice to talk with you.